Take and Write, Part 2, is the title of our exhortation, taken from Isaiah chapter 8 and verses 5 to 22. In every age, the people of God will surely be tried. But through the trials, they see their blessed Lord caring and undertaking for them the many cares and burdens of life. They are comforted. And in a trial, we say, let our faith increase. Ryle, J.C. Ryle observed well, he says, we would have peace and calmness and quietness of spirit. Let us often say, Lord, increase our faith. A hundred painful things may happen to us each week in this evil world of which our weak, poor minds cannot see the reason. Isn't it so true? Without faith, we shall be constantly disquieted and cast down. Nothing will make us cheerful and tranquil, but an abiding sense of Christ's love, Christ's wisdom, Christ's care over us, and Christ's providential management of all our affairs. Faith will not sink under the weight of evil tidings. Psalm 112, verse 7. Faith can sit still and wait for better times. Faith can find room to build Ebenezer's under any circumstances and can sing songs in the night in any condition. He that believeth shall not make haste. Thou shalt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Isaiah 28 verse 16 and Proverbs 26 verse 3. Once more, let the lesson be graven in our hearts. If we would travel comfortably through the world, we must believe. Let faith increase is the exhortation that God gave through Isaiah the prophet to the people of Israel. When they saw the enemies their immediate neighbour and their neighbour's neighbour setting their army in array, ready to invade their land. They were a weaker people, they were a weaker army, and they were in a, as it were, losing military situation. But you know, in Israel is the living and true God. God has instructed Solomon many years ago to build a temple where God's presence would reside with his people. So how can the people of God, with the Spirit of God in them, with the Word of God, written in their hearts, be afraid of evil tidings. The prophet Isaiah was told to prophesy unto Judah of impending war and threat of invasion from the Assyrians up north. It spoke of future judgment when Assyria would conquer Syria and invade Israel and Judah and when Babylon would take Judah to exile. It was a very grave picture, impending war. Well, we were mentioning the years leading up to the Second World War, how it built up over more than 10 years, how the activity move at first quite slowly and we were looking at things afar and how things developed very quickly and the events changed. 
well. Today we are in a similar situation, isn't it? We see the war cry of failing um, people, of failing uh, uh, frightened men seeking to push the world into war again. And how can calamity be prevented as we see the situations developing before our eyes? Is there fear in your heart? Well, for the people in Judah, it was very real. And for us, well, we may say from history, we may learn from the lesson of history that indeed danger may not be that far away. And so what will be our response for Isaiah? Well, God has instructed him to be married and God would give him two sons and that he would name the two sons in such a way as to give a sign to the people of Israel that disaster is coming and that the enemy that is coming will not make, will not, cannot be stayed. They will come quickly. But God will keep for himself a remnant of his people. And for him, God instructed him to take a scroll and to write. Write concerning the future that is to come. And so we have the next five chapters, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 12, giving to us the prophecy of what is to come. But for the people of God, you would see that God would certainly be a refuge for us in times of trouble. And we can safely trust Him knowing that He knows the end from the beginning. And so in His prophecy, He provided to Israel or to the Judah an idea of how to escape the cal calamity to come. What must be their response? And so we were uh, looking at it up to verse 8 last week. And now we back up to verse 5 on the thought, comfort for his own. God provides comfort for his, for his people. In the midst of uh, unfavorable circumstances, the Lord is, says to us, let us trust Him. Verse 5, The Lord said unto me again, that is to the prophet Isaiah, saying, For as much as this people refuses the water of Shiloh that goes softly, and rejoice in resin and Remalia's son. In other words, they were not contented, satisfied with what God has for them. And what did they do? Verse 7, Now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth upon them the waters of the river, strong and many. God will raise up an enemy, even the king of Assyria, and all his glory and he shall come like a great flood. He shall come over all his channels, go over all his banks. He shall pass through Judah. And he shall overflow and go over. He shall reach even to the neck. Well, to the neck, we said that it's a, it's a point of weakness, isn't it? Where you know that it is for your very life. And stretch out his wings 
and the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breath of thy land. You will be overwhelmed. You will be overcome. But it ended with the word, O Emmanuel. But God is with us. Although it is darkness everywhere, the people of God is given the assurance of God's presence with them. Among the people of God, there are two groups. The faithful remnant in Judah and the unfaithful in Judah who sought ways to live lacking dependence upon God. In other words, they have some other trust. They have some other help which they sought beside the Lord, their God. For the faithful, it is for the faithful that Isaiah brings the word of encouragement, that the enemy tread on Emmanuel's land. In other words, this is God's territory. Can you prosper doing so? No, you cannot prosper. Certainly not. In fact, the enemies won't succeed. It is pointless there to make alliance with Assyria to protect against Israel and Syria up north. Verse 9. Associate yourselves, O ye people, and ye shall be broken in pieces. And give year, O ye of far countries. Gird yourselves, and ye, be, ye shall be broken in pieces. Gird yourself, and ye shall be broken in pieces. Isaiah is saying that, giving a warning to the people. Deceased, deceased from trusting in the arms of flesh, deceased in trusting in human chariots, for they will not hold in the time of battle. They shall be destroyed. Verse 10. Take counsel together and it shall come to naught. So all your planning, we said human planning, will not succeed. It shall come to naught. Speak the word, and it shall not stand, for God is with us. And God is doing so, sending the enemies in order to chastise his own people. Then this brings us now to the thought in verse 11 to 18. Trust the Lord amidst uncertainties. Trust the Lord amidst uncertainties. Verse 11. For the Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people. So the people say, associate yourselves. Make alliance with Assyria. They are strong, they are powerful. Surely they can defeat the enemy. Surely Israel and Syria will be no match for them. Say ye not, the Lord says to Isaiah, a confederacy to them to whom this people shall say a confederacy. Neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. So he's saying that there will be a lot of fear-mongering during that time. But you must not fear, because the Lord will be with you to take care of you. That if they kept up to the fear of God, and kept down the fear of men. Matthew Henry says, they should find God their refuge. Isaiah is exhorted by the Lord to trust Him. When the nation is turning to find security in their confederacy with Assyria against the threat of Israel and Syria. 
that's very common, isn't it? That when we are faced with an issue, instead of going to our closet to seek the Lord in prayer, to ask the Lord to show us what is going on, what is happening, and to seek Him to understand and to find a solution, well, we make haste right? to do this, go to this person, and that, and that, and that, rather than be quiet before God. But Isaiah is exhorted by the Lord to trust Him. Trust Him, even though everyone is turning. Trust Him. Even if you are the last man standing, let yourself be the last man standing. And even if you have to fall, fall. Let not their fear get into your heart to cause you to fear as the Lord's words to Isaiah. And so, verse 13, Sanctify the Lord of hosts Himself. Give regard to the Lord. Worship Him. Honour Him. Fear Him, reverence Him. Give regard to Him, for He is the source of safety and true defence. Let us seek aid from God. Albert Barnes well said, The Lord shall be a sanctuary for His people. The word sanctuary means a, a holy place, a place that is consecrated, where God, the presence of God dwell, as it was in the tabernacle when Israel was in the wilderness, as it is the temple that was sitting in Jerusalem that Solomon built. It was still there, you know, in the, in the divided kingdom. And the reason why God did not, did not destroy Judah, but left himself one tribe is because his presence is there. His presence is there. And the Lord indeed will be, will continue to be the help of his people. Sanctify the Lord of hosts. A lot of hosts described the Lord as powerful with the host of His angels, with the host of His army. One angel He would send later on during the time of a later king to destroy 185,000 of the Assyrian army within a single night. Dear friends, we must not take these truths as if it is a story, some fiction. But this was exactly what happened. That one angel was enough to destroy the entire Assyrian army so that the general returned. Wow! Wow! in a very uh, shameful way. And when he reached his palace, what happened? He was killed by his own children, his own sons. Terrible judgment. Terrible judgment. The Lord wants us to see and understand that indeed in Israel, there is a God. And because there's a God in Israel, therefore, the people of God must not be afraid. They must seek asylum, they must seek refuge 
in the sanctuary of the Lord. As the psalmist says in Psalm 46 verse 1, God is our refuge and our strength. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. And we are reminded recently, isn't it, in our special Thanksgiving service as we were meditating upon Psalm 46, how the Lord said to His people in the time of calamity and crisis, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Silla. Silla means pause. Pause and think and ponder and consider. We have God as our refuge. And therefore, we must not fret. Rather, we must commit ourselves afresh to His care. And the psalmist is saying to us, that there is much assurance, experience of God's care. And therefore, we must not fret. And he says here in a, in a concerted way, right, God is our refuge and our strength. You know what he's saying to everyone? Everyone has to realize and together, right, together with the Lord in the midst, he will not fail us. A very present help in trouble. God's power to protect and ability to give strength is not limited to only certain individuals. But He is claiming this truth for all of God's people. Well, this was what we said during the time of the pandemic, isn't it? We were the only one open in this entire building for many months. Many months. Because we believed not that we are any better, that our God is real and is true and is living and we must not be afraid. And we refuse to be closed. We refuse to be shut down. We refuse to be shut. This is what Isaiah is receiving as a message from the Lord. Do not be shut down. Let the light continue to shine. So, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, doctrine and application must go together. Indeed, it is possible to be well-versed in the Bible and yet it does not profit us in the end if we never apply it. We can analyse it like a Shakespearean Play. He, he used that example. <laughs> and they are not just concerned to do that. But Scripture never does that. There must always be application. It's practical. The people of God must take hold of the truth and find strength by exercising faith in obeying God. God shall surely help. Verse 4 of Psalm 46 and verse 5. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her and that right early. God is in the midst of her. His people. He is with us by His Spirit, His Holy Spirit. He was with Israel in the wilderness as they encamped around the tabernacle. 
the temple that Solomon built was there, God promised His presence to help them. As we recall the inauguration of the temple, 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 22, Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven, verse 28 and 29, yet have respect unto the prayer of thy servant and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to hearken unto the cry and to the prayer which thy servant prayeth before thee today, that thy eyes may be opened towards this house night and day even toward the place of which thou hast said, My name shall be there, that thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make toward this place. That is why, you know, even after the temple was destroyed, you see Daniel praying right, towards the direction of Jerusalem three times a day, right, three times a day. He trusted the presence of God when he said that he will be with his people. And indeed, it was true, isn't it? Like the lions in the den didn't devour him. He survived that night in the lion's den. Verse 45, 44 and 45 of 1 Kings 8, And if thy people go out to battle against their enemy, whithersoever thou shalt send them, and shalt pray unto the Lord toward the city which thou hast chosen, and toward the house that I have built for thy name, then hear thou in heaven their prayer and their supplication, and maintain their cause. Why did Israel panic? Why did, why did the people of Judah panic? Because they see a greater foe. The army was greater. Their army was greater. Their chariots seemed to be stronger. We are, a ma- we are a people of sight, isn't it? But we are called to faith in the invisible, living and true God. Can we understand that? In the fullness of time, we are called to believe in Jesus of Nazareth, that He is the Christ, that out of all the real estate of the world, God would send His only begotten Son into that one tiny crossroad of three continents. Asia, Europe, Africa. And there he would make a witness to be the saviour of the world. In Galilee, from Nazareth, a most obscure, unobtrusive, we said, Witness, hidden as it were. Who would believe? But this is the Saviour, dear friends. So Israel or Judah at that time panicked, isn't it? They could not see. They have lost touch with their God. And that is the sad plight of many a household in this land, isn't it? Albeit Christian homes, we have lost touch with our God. And in the time of our distress, we cling on to anything we could take hold of, to no avail, to no avail. How sad is it? That is why God recorded the scriptures for us to learn. That our faith may increase, that we may have a sight like that of the prophet, 
so that when God would bring a similar situation before us, we would know how to respond rightly. Verse 15, And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. And many who fail to believe, fail to trust God, they will be in great trouble in the time when the distress would come. But you have my testimony, what I have written for you. Right, so, you know, all the words that God gave to Isaiah, he was to write them down and then to rehearse it. Verse 17, And I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord has given me, uh, his two sons, his family. They are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth in Mount Zion. He's still in Mount Zion, <laughs> still in Jerusalem. God is still there. Why did the people of God panic? So while others stumbled and fell into despair, they should be enabled to wait on God and see themselves reserved for better times. And so Isaiah in faith was resolute in his heart to trust God, even when others defect. The scroll that he wrote of God's advice to Judah, he shall keep as a testimony against them. He will wait upon the Lord. He shall hope in the Lord. This is the sense of the word wait. It is not a hopeless wait, but a hopeful wait, fully trusting the Lord's ability to secure them in the midst of calamity. Not only himself, but the two children that God has given him, whose names are signs of what God will do and the remedy that he will prescribe for their safety, they are to trust in the Lord. God is still the living God is still living and enthroned in Mount Zion, the city of God. As such, he will not fret. Trust not in sorcery, verses 19 to 22. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, unto wizards that peep and that mutter, should not a people seek their God? For the living to the dead, in their desperate plight, they would consult familiar spirits and they would be overthrown into despair. Instead of keeping close to God and His Word to find comfort from His promises, they went after their own understanding. Familiar spirits and wizards, Moses warned Israel in Deuteronomy 18, verse 9 to 14, before they entered the land. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, Thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh a son or a daughter to pass through the fire, that uses divination or observer of times, an enchanter or a witch or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits or wizards or necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because these abominations, because of these abominations, the Lord thy God shall drive them out from before thee. So it was for the, that same reason that 
the Canaanites were driven out of their homes, of their land. And now, after so many hundreds of years of possessing the land, why are they going back to these abominations? These are the idolatrous ways of the Canaanites. So we see that the Canaanite influence was very much alive after they have entered the promised land for more than 800 years since 1400 BC. Alas, we say this is the hardness of the hearts of God's people. Life will become extremely precarious because God is against them. Behold trouble and darkness, dimness of anguish, and they shall be driven to darkness. But there is a remnant that God will protect. Witness of the written word, verse 1 and 2, true and faithful is what is what God has given to us, verse 3 to 4, comfort to His own, verse 5 to 10, and verse 11 to 18, or verse uh, 5 to 11 to 18, trust the Lord amidst uncertainties, and finally, trust not in sorceries, verse 19 to 22. May the Lord help us. Let us pray. Father, we thank Thee for Thy Word. Strengthen Thy people to see how weak we can be. And yet in our weakness, when we look to Thee, we shall, our weakness shall find strength, the strength undergirded by Thee. O Lord, help us to wait upon Thee. Help us to look to Thee and help us to be still and not fret and realize that Thou art God and Thou art still on the throne and that we can come to Thee and find help, very present help in times of trouble. So Lord, may Thou strengthen Thy people and comfort this, in this time of need. This I pray with thanksgiving through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.